Sweat ran from under Watt's hat as he and his master's foaming horse cut through the hot summer air of South Carolina. With a tight chest, Watt found himself listening to the rhythmic pounding of the horse's hooves, after which he forced his attention back to the task at hand, which was to alert his master that the British were on their way. In fact, the British had already burnt the home of Captain John McClure and arrested three neighbors, including Colonel Bratton's older brother, Robert, for execution. While maneuvering through the backcountry frontier, Watt continued to encourage the mount onward towards Nation's Ford on the Catawba River. As the horse leapt into the river and began crossing, Watt welcomed the cool water and the sight of his master's thin and wiry figure on the opposing bank. At Sumter's camp, Watt approached his master, Colonel William Bratton, who was surrounded by a few men, some of whom Watt recognized as men who had served alongside his master in the Snow and Cherokee campaigns. Twenty miles away, on the Bratton plantation, Martha Bratton paces nervously on the porch, awaiting the arrival of her husband and Watt. Her breathing stops as she begins to make out the red and green coats. When her fears are realized, she gasps out, The enemy... In a mad dash, Martha makes her way to the shed where her husband had stashed the malicious gunpowder. Martha then musters all of her strength to pull the heavy chest onto a nearby heap of hay. In her mind, she repeatedly screams, I must keep this out of the enemy's hands. Martha quickly darts back into the house, nearly tripping over her dress. She emerges with the flint and steel and a jar of moonshine. After using the flint and steel to get a small fire started, in a last-ditch effort to set ablaze, Martha pours the family spirits onto the chest before retreating back to the porch where she stares out as the enemy continues to slowly gain ground. Instantly, Martha's mind is flooded with the images of what she heard happened at the Waxhaws. During this nightmarish daydream, Martha is suddenly jolted awake by the deafening noise of the explosion behind her. As the smoke begins to bellow up from the set ablaze gunpowder, Martha watches her approaching visitors regain control of their horses before continuing their journey at an increased speed. At this sight, Martha rushes through the door to find her huddled children and tells them, Quick, go hide. After a split second, Martha looks down to find her six-year-old, William Jr., clinging to her dress in fear. To comfort the small boy, Martha rests her hands gently on his shoulders and with a soft and calm voice encourages him by saying, Go hide in the corner of the chimney and stay there no matter what. Yes, Mama, he replies and then runs off. After what felt like only mere seconds later, Martha finds herself standing on the porch while the passing men immediately go to inspect the fire. Next, the men commence with their search for traitors and goods and any and everything they can confiscate. Martha watches in horror as four of her children are found and brought before her. She listens intently as the red-clad New York volunteers rummage through her house. She watches as dragoons move to and fro from among the outbuildings, looking for plunder. As Martha stands by her trembling children, she is taken back to see the faces of the men in the local Loyalist militia. 
Some belong to people whom she once greeted as family friends at the Bethesda Presbyterian Church. After several more intense moments of searching, a few men began interrogating Martha about the whereabouts of her husband. With every unanswered question, the men became more and more irritated. One very gruff man came ever closer to Martha as he said, Now we know Sumter has given his militia leave to help with the harvest. At which time the man took hold of a nearby sickle that had only been used earlier that day. The gruff man, now wielding this as a weapon, walked intensely over towards Martha. Yet she stayed very calm by looking straight ahead and considering her misfortune. With the sickle's blade now against her throat, the gruff man again asked, Where is Mr. Bratton? At that moment, with a thousand worries, Martha's one thought comes forward. The Lord is my protector. Martha shifts her gaze to the gruff man and finds her voice. I'd rather die than betray my country. As the gruff man begins to move the blade, he suddenly finds himself on the ground. His superior officer had stopped him from delivering the deadly blow. As the officer apologizes to the startled Martha, a new silhouette emerges from what looks to be a hundred and twenty men. This man is on a fine thoroughbred mount. Like the other dragoons, he is in a striking green coat with a bearskin covered hat. Captain Hook, the man beside Martha, acknowledges and appears to be more startled than she. As the gruff man gets back onto his feet, he approaches Captain Hook and blurts out the insolence of this one as he tilts his head towards Martha before disappearing into the crowd. Captain Hook's pale blue eyes pierce Martha's and he brashly commands her to prepare a meal. As Captain Hook and his officers make themselves at home, Martha tries her best to keep her composure. She serves them the last of her family's smoked ham and cornbread. She tries not to make eye contact, but listens intensely for a clue about what will happen next. Every time Captain Hook would open his mouth, the most vile profanities came out. Every instant in which he took the Lord's name in vain, Martha could feel her ears burning until she was sure she was in the presence of the devil himself. As Captain Huck and his men continued to make merry, Huck began to say, "'Tis a shame about those poor boys at the Waxhaws. All that was left of some boys were bloody stumps." Martha steps between Captain Hook as he gazes at her children. It's a shame for Mr. Bratton to come to such an end, don't you think? Couldn't you encourage him to join the more superior force? At that moment, Martha felt tears pulling up in her eyes, but she held them at bay. After locking eyes with Captain Hook again, Martha could no longer hold her tongue. I would rather my husband die in Sumter's army, true to his country and calls, than live as a traitor in yours. An evil smile then stretches under Huck's red cheeks as he says, We have driven the regulars out of their country, and even if it rained militia from the heavens, I would not value them. At that, Huck stood up and ordered his men to do something with Martha and her children. You can lock us in the attic, Martha suggested. At that, she and her children were walked like prisoners to the attic, where a large wooden door was shut and locked from the outside. After she was sure that their captors had left, Martha dashed to the window, where she could watch to see which direction they went. 
towards the Williamson Plantation, Martha sighed, as they too were patriots. After some time had passed, along with the thought that she and her children could have been burned alive, Martha began to hear the creaking of the steps and the turning of the lock. As Martha and her children held their breath, a small voice emerged. Mummy? Just then her youngest son peeked from behind the door. His face was covered in soot. The only white happened to be where his tears had ran down his face. Gather again at last, Martha and all of her children knelt down and began to earnestly pray. At that time, little did Martha and her children know, but Colonel William Bratton was making his way home and on his way collecting more militiamen. Now, a hundred and forty men strong, they continued to walk. While not common in South Carolina, that night the men just happened to be able to continue marching because it was a little brighter than normal due to the aurora borealis. At seeing this, one young man muttered, God, tis truly on our side. After more intel came to William Bratton, he and his men made their way to the Williamson Plantation. It was around 5.30 a.m. when they arrived. The men were then reminded to keep cover and to keep heart, just as their ancestors had done when they fought the British. The men were then split in two so that they could flank their enemy. They hid behind apple and peach trees and behind a large split rail fence. As the British were just waking up in time for breakfast, they were scared stiff to hear the shrill rebel cry, one that the men had learned from fighting the Cherokee. Next, the bullets began to fly. This time, the Patriots wouldn't fight in a way that they could be hacked to death, but behind covering. At hearing the gunfire, Huck, who had been staying within the Williamson home, quickly emerged ill-equipped to see what was happening. For a split second, the comment that he had made the previous day to Mrs. Bratton came back to revisit him. Huck then ran back to the house to retrieve his green coat, but it was too late. The door had already been locked by the family inside. Huck mounted his horse and rode to the fight and instantly realized the severity of the situation. Colonel James Ferguson was shot and killed, while Lieutenant John Adamson of the New York Volunteers had fallen from his horse wounded. Huck frantically tried to rally his confused and disoriented troops. During this time, he couldn't have known that John Carroll had taken aim. Then suddenly, as Carol's gun rang out, the battle was over, and Huck's lifeless body fell from his horse. He had been shot in the back of the head. It was a humiliating death for a man who had made a name for himself as being an ungodly man, a man who had murdered an unarmed boy while reading a Bible and for destroying the home and library of Reverend John Simpson out of spite. While the battle of Huck's defeat only lasted 15 minutes, the victory helped restore morale in South Carolina. In fact, the battle led to a series of other important events, such as the victories at Kings Mountain and Cowpens. Today, if you visit historic Brattonsville, you can walk an interpretive trail which showcases the battlefield site of Huck's defeat. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it. And as always, thanks for watching.